I love running. It's liberating for the mind, body and soul. But it does come with some caveats. You know me, I'm normally quite a positive guy, but today I've got five things that really grind my gears right now about running. <laughs> back to the channel guys thanks for tuning in it's always appreciated it's ed positive mental attitude bud here there's some stuff at the moment that really drives me wild about running i'm going to run through five things that at the moment just really grind my gears if it's your first time here hit that subscribe button and also click the bell below for notifications i want to roll out those new videos for you and it really helps the channel out too if you give this video a thumbs up like and share it with your running buddies danke schön so first up today is the utterly unfathomable English weather. When I was writing this piece, it was February the 2nd, and we had 11 degrees centigrade outside. 11. It's supposed to be winter. What the hell's going on? Mild as you like, about 52 Fahrenheit. I mean, it should be punishingly cold at the moment, but you can practically get away with wearing a t-shirt out there. It makes it impossible to guess what you should wear for your run on any given day. You can have rain, wind, blistering sunshine. You never quite know what you're going to get. It's kind of like spinning the wheels and you could just get a random set of weather on any given day. You don't want to dress up too much because you'll overheat. You don't want to wear too little because you'll begin to freeze. The temperatures can change really quickly as well and quite drastically. I think it's quite distracting and confusing really. You can never really second guess what's going to happen. It really makes getting used of the seasons as well very difficult. You try and pick what you're going to wear for a race even down to socks and stuff and it just starts getting really difficult. I'm not sure whether it's just me but I found myself using bigger jackets and long sleeve tops less and less every single year. Is that down to climate change and stuff like that? Is the globe just warming up and do I need those sort of all weather outfits a little less? If you get your running gear wrong you just can't focus on the training session you're supposed to do more worried about whether your hands are going to freeze if you don't feel comfortable i guess you really can't get the best out of the session and right now it's very seldom do i actually nail the clothing so that's my first thing is the english weather number two is outsoles that look great for grip but sadly fall short. The Pegasus Trail 3 for me is one such shoe, sadly. It's an absolute winner on the light trails, but if you try wearing it on anything that resembles an icy path, concrete, after about 50 or so miles, I've found that the pattern on the ridge parts of the shoe is just worn away, and it's putting your life in your own hands, really. It's just pretty much worn off the lugs, and after that, it's only really good on light trails. Slippery experience and bordering on unusable when there's been a little bit of light rain, even. Not sure what the point of that initial pattern is on the bottom of the Peg Trail 3. It wears down so quickly, it does smack a little bit of Nike saying, well, yeah, it's worn down a bit. Maybe you should get yourself a new pair. Or grab the follow-up, you know. The React midsole on the upper are practically untouched. It's just the outsole that seems to be wearing quite quickly. If you're running on on smooth stone or marble just forget it you've got to stay on those looser surfaces and it seems to work all right on that but i think for those who commute to their trail areas could be a bit of a problem nike are a bit hit and miss on the outsoles at the moment there's things like the streak fly and the vomero 16 which are absolute winners and then something of a disappointment really in the peg trail 3 so the second thing on today's list is those outsoles that just don't stand up to the test of time i love all my viewers out there guys there's some fantastic people as part of the ed Bud running shoe community i love dipping into the comments there's some fantastic insight there people putting four five six hundred miles into shoes and giving us their thoughts sadly though this year i have encountered a few one brand fans people that only consider one manufacturer they'll not even entertain the thought of trying something else and if somebody else does they're wrong i think an extreme take on this is where they can magically tell you that a shoe's going to be great or not. It could be a jacket, it could be a gel, it could be a shirt, a pair of shorts. They know already without even putting it on that it's going to be total trash. It's just really bizarre to me, really strange that someone can have thoughts only about how they feel on something. They can't show any empathy or understanding that other people might actually need something else. Why limit yourself to just one brand or logo or one designer or one model of something? There's so many things out there to try and enjoy and experiment with. You know, something might be great for you and you can use it for years and years. Well, that's wonderful. There could be something out there that's a little better. There might be something actually that you want to try just for the fact that it's interesting. Just broadens your mind a little bit i mean yes we've got an embarrassment of riches when it comes to running shoes right now 
is a shoe for practically everything. You've got Saw, Coros, Adidas, Garmin as well, Asics, Osprey, you've got Polar, all produce some fantastic items. Some really great stuff, maybe not so good stuff sometimes, but it's fun to test these options out and not limit ourselves down to just one brand. You also find that there's a reverse of that, that some people just hate one brand for these odd reasons. Like, I don't know, they've got this terrible ethic or something happened 40 years ago and they just can't bear to think about even wearing it. It does seem a little odd to place ourselves into a room with no windows or doors and then moan about it. This seems nuts to me but I'm just one man. Issue number four today is those endless upper updates. So you love a shoe, it's like a glove round your foot, a velvet it never fails you, despite using it in any weather for any type of session. You pound the shoe into the ground mile after mile. Then the manufacturer announces a new version. You get very excited about it, you're super hyped, ready to pick it up the instant it releases. But then they change the upper and the lockdown's completely ruined. There's no major improvements and they charge 30 to 40 earth credits extra on top, just for the privilege of trying out the V2. Time after time this has happened, doesn't it, guys? We've all seen it. It's very rare for the second or third iterations of a shoe to actually get better. I've seen it before uh, certain runners have said, Oh, I really love the original version and like nine or ten versions down the line the manufacturer returns to that and everyone's happy again. I mean there's a few exceptions to the rule isn't it but I think in the main this is what happens. Quite often the manufacturer will solve one little problem that people had with the shoe but then replace that with three or four others. Look at the next percent two. Nike solved this sort of length issue there with that sort of overhanging rubber piece at the front of the shoe. They placed that reinforcement around the toe box there and inadvertently made the shoe that little bit longer. And they put those perforated laces in that some people love and some people hate. And then the upper was replaced, wasn't it, with that more flexible roomy mesh. So you ended up with a shoe that was actually a little bit longer, a little bit more accommodating, but for some people, too much. The original was perfection. So just an upper update, but it's kind of brought in a whole load of new issues and problems that perhaps weren't there before if you really love the original. Like in program testing, when you're coding, you want to change one thing and then test it, see if it's actually had the desired effect. Here, they're kind of changing about three or four things and actually introducing a load more bugs into the system. Is it change for change's sake or is this true innovation? I think sometimes if it ain't broke, don't fix it. On to number five now. The last thing grinding my gears today is exclusive and limited releases. So many people getting upset at the moment that they missed out on the street fly. I'm sure this one's going to be properly released soon, guys. Sportshoes.com over here in the UK is showing a retail version which has got pink and red sections on it. That will be here soon. So don't worry. If the money's burning a hole in your pocket, You'll soon be able to blow it on this one. It does appear that some manufacturers are deliberately holding back stock to generate hype. Just limiting certain new shoes with very small numbers. Look at that street flight, it sold out in minutes, didn't it? Especially in some of the medium sort of sizes or the larger sizes. Left loads of hopeful customers with cash in hand and no shoes. Nike clearly have got lots of these to go around. It's not like they're rare or anything it's not like the materials are they have to mine for in the ground or anything you know they could just produce them right you know these things are produced months and months in advance it's all just mind games to try and hype everything out and make people feel that they really need them i've received countless messages about when that shoe's going to restock it's a great shoe it's very nice but there's lots of other shoes out there. You can see how this works out for Nike with the Jordan releases, some of those retros that they bring out. I think it works for that, but not for running shoes. It seems crazy to limit a release like this, even if you were lucky enough to pick one up. I mean, what is the boon, really? You get it a few weeks before everyone else and you get a special message from Sir Mo Farah saying how great the street fly is. More durability and quality control issues though with this shoe. I wasn't really blown away by the quality of my pair. Longtime viewer Rob Weatherall had a serious problem with his. Where the tongues glued to the front section of the toe box, it just completely came away after one run. Thanks for sending the pictures in there, Rob, so that the viewers can see some of the problems you've had. Just looks like the glue's not up to the normal standard. There's loads of shoddy glue marks and odd stitching on my pair. Did you have any issues with your pair of the Streak Flies? Let me know in the comments below.
You guys know I love running. These are just some bugbears and things that I've got right now. I'm glad I voiced those things so I've ranted a little bit and the weight is now off of my shoulders. My mind is clear. What are your current running shoe bugbears? Let myself and Beast know down in the comments. People want more Beast? Ah, oh, Beast, hello. Thought she was enjoying it, but clearly not. A musical interlude for you. I've always been a fan of the Proclaimers ever since I was a little guy. Really loved their songs, just really direct. Kind of sounded almost like punk to me, I guess, but with acoustic guitars. Some of my favourites from the Proclaimers are Throw the R Away, I'm On My Way, as well as a super track. It's like country tinge to that one. And of course the superb track Sunshine on Lee. That one really gets me right here. Oh. It's a beautiful song. Always reminds me of my wife, that song. The words are really quite poignant about kind of how she found me and we found each other and how privileged I am to be with her and get to spend my time with her. Yeah, that's a special meaning for me, that one. <sighs> I'm all right, it's okay, it's cool. Just seem like super guys as well, the Proclaimers. There's a really cool interview that the BBC did a little while ago, sort of documentary, I suppose, where they sort of chat about their career and how thankful they are, you know, for where they are. Not mega stars, but everyone knows the Proclaimers, don't they? Had some fantastic hits, and they seem to be very focused on family as well. They don't let the sort of the showbiz stuff take over. There's no egos there, they're just the same guys that they were at the start. I do remember going on holiday with a friend of mine, and uh, went in this bar called The Fountain. It was over in Magaluf or something like that. And there was an Elvis impersonator in there. And he found it really funny that we both sort of had glasses, looked quite similar, and of course had to call us the Proclaimers. I remember just after that, there was a chap coming around who was selling sort of watches and things like that. And the Elvis impersonator fancied a bit of a break, so he went and got a pint from the bar and let the, the chap do some songs. Um, but while he was doing that, the local police turned up and chased after him. It was one of the funniest things I've ever seen. Um, he made a joke that, oh, you know, the, the police are there. And uh, he kind of laughed it off and ignored him, but they were actually there. So yeah, he vaulted over a bush and ran off. It was hilarious. He managed to finish doing Hound Dog though, so the uh, audience weren't left wanting. Thanks for tuning in, guys. I hope you've enjoyed today's episode. If you haven't done so yet, hit that subscribe button and click the bell below for notifications of when we roll out those new videos for you. You can support the channel too by grabbing some merchandise and also joining the membership scheme from the links below in the description. Remember to give this video a thumbs up, like, and share it with your running buddies. My name's Ed Budd, and I'll be seeing you.